This video is brought to you by friend of the channel, SteelSeries, makers of the best keyboards, mice, and headsets on the market. SteelSeries have recently released their range of arena desktop speakers, and they go just as hard as the rest of the SteelSeries lineup. Use offer code SKILLUP to get a 12% discount from the SteelSeries store, or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Gamers, thank you to those of you attentive enough to notice that my voice was a little off last week. More than one person describing it as Kermit the Frog, if he were Australian. So like Kermit the Cane Toad, I guess? I was sick last week. Oh my God, was I sick. I came back from holidays all rip rare in a go. And this mystery virus was like, eh, not so fast. My tonsils were the size of golf balls and they felt like they were covered in broken glass, which is why my Dead Space review was a little later than I would have liked. The good news though, is that drugs are good. And after ingesting many of them, I am feeling fantastic and ready for another week of capital C content. A lot to get through this week too. I mean, we had that Xbox developer direct, the shadow drop of Hi-Fi Rush, the announcement of season two of the Last of Us TV show. God help us having to go through all of that discourse again. God help whoever they cast as Abby. Just throw your phone away. Just throw it in the water, okay? Just don't be on social media. And best of all, Fantastic popped up to provide an update on the day before. And uh, yeah, it, it didn't go so well for them. So let's talk about that. Just as a quick recap, here is what I said about the day before, literally last week on this very show. Roll it, Austin. If I sound skeptical, it's because I genuinely believe that all the marketing to this point has been a lie and that the final product will look absolutely nothing like what's been promised. I'll remind you that this game is set to release in just over a month, and yet we've seen absolutely no actual gameplay. So that was last week. What happened this week? Well, it all started a few days ago when suddenly, mysteriously, the day before was delisted from Steam. Okay, that's weird, right? The second most wishlisted game on Steam suddenly vanishing? That's a little unusual, right? Oh no, not according to Fantastic, who quickly issued a statement on Steam's community boards saying that the delisting was a minor technical issue that affects numerous games and that the title would be back up shortly. Well, we waited and waited and waited and the game did not return. Curious. Some hours later, Fantastic would issue a, let's call it update to their story. Quote, Dear fans, right before the release, Steam blocked our game page at the request of a private individual because of the name The Day Before, end quote. They'd go into detail that even though the game was announced on January of 2021, they hadn't actually secured the trademark for the name The Day Before. They claimed that someone else then went and registered that trademark before Fantastic could, meaning that they no longer had the right to use this name. Okay, so first of all, how do you announce the name of your massively ambitious survival MMO game without first securing the trademark? I mean, I'm no business expert, but that sounds like a bit of a Bush League move, right? Furthermore, if you look at the filing that they link in their Twitter post, you'll notice that this other person based in Korea didn't commence their trademark application until May of that year, four months after Fantastic announced their game. So this wasn't some speedy sleight of hand, this was four months after. You want to know when Fantastic did file their trademark application? The 27th of January last year, a full year after they had announced their game. In that time, they would have seen that another person had already applied for that trademark, and that detail becomes important in this next part. Returning to Fantastic's Twitter JPEG, they said, quote, Previously, we were not aware of the existence of claims. We found out about this only on January 19th, 2023. We received a complaint from him and a request to contact him, end quote. Okay, so this cannot be true because when you apply for a trademark, you are made aware of other trademarks already using the same words. They would have seen that someone had already trademarked this, and I guess they were just hoping that this person wouldn't try to contend their usage of the title? Okay, so here's where it gets really fun. Quote, We had previously planned to post a lengthy gameplay video later this month, but we'll have to sort this issue out first. We'll post a video ASAP. End quote. So I get that you need to work through your trademark dispute, sure, but you can absolutely show some gameplay of your video game without any reference to that title. You can do that, but you're not, because I reckon that gameplay is still being faked. I mean, made. It gets better though, quote, as a result, we have made the difficult decision to postpone the launch to November 10th, 2023, that is a nine month delay. We understand that this may disappoint many of our fans. However, we want to ensure we release the best game possible, end quote. So which is it? When you say as a result of the trademark dispute, you can't finish that paragraph talking about game quality because those are two separate issues. And furthermore, whoever heard of a nine month delay based solely on a trademark dispute? That is nonsense. Sure enough, a few days later, Fantastic updated their story yet again. After earlier blaming the delay on the trademark dispute, they then admitted to IGN that they had earlier planned to delay the title anyway. So we go from a Steam bug 
to a trademark dispute, and we go from a delay based on said trademark dispute to, oh, we were gonna delay it anyway. All of this, of course, has led to a bit of a run on the game, with even their lead Discord moderator, who has in the past claimed to be an employee of Fantastic, saying that he wonders if the game is real. Let me tell you, my dude, this game is not real. Or if it is, it is absolutely nothing like what is being showcased in these trailers. I genuinely believe this is a massive bait and switch designed to drum up interest in Fantastic's other projects, one of which is a weird Microsoft Teams-style productivity app that they recently spruiked on their channel. Imagine having a team made up of volunteers making the second most wishlisted game on Steam, and you're also trying to put out some online working tool thing. Like, what is this company? What are they doing? How is anyone buying into this? This is abandoned 2.0, and while I am highly skeptical that this game will ever be released, I am thankful that it exists in the way that it does, because it makes for absolutely fantastic this week in video game fodder, no pun intended. Team, keep it up, keep it coming. Speaking of scams, Riot Games is in the process of being shaken down right now. Last week, they confirmed that hackers had breached their security and had stolen the source code for League of Legends, Teamfight Tactics, and their legacy anti-cheat program. Riot said that they had received a ransom note after the attack and quote, needless to say, we won't pay, end quote. The hacker made their demands public through Vice, who received a copy of the ransom note and a telegram address that was being used by the hackers and Riot employees to communicate. The hackers have some big demands, but they see them otherwise, quote, we understand the significance of these artifacts and the impact their release to the public would have on your major titles, Valorant and League of Legends. In light of this, we are making a small request for an exchange of $10 million, end quote. If that's small, I'd really hate to see big. Will Riot pay? Uh, you never know. Some companies do pay as the risk of not doing so far exceeds whatever the hacker is asking for. Many don't and choose to deal with the fallout come what may. Could the leaked source code be a problem for Riot? Absolutely. Source code makes it way easier for cheat makers to develop new cheats for games. And with just how important competitive integrity is across all Riot games, a big jump in the number of functional cheats out there could be a big problem. No resolution on this one yet, but I will keep you posted. Recently, it was announced that Blizzard would be exiting China after its ongoing publishing deal with NetEase collapsed in a heap. NetEase had published a number of titles in China on Blizzard's behalf, most notably Overwatch, Hearthstone, and World of Warcraft, and none of those are now playable in China by any official means. The Chinese are pissed, as well they should be. Imagine dumping 14 years of your life into a video game, and all of a sudden you lose access to that because some executive assholes couldn't figure out how to share the spoils. NetEase are so pissed about this that they actually tore down a Warcraft statue that sat outside their HQ. Talk about burning the boats. Hard to see how these two entities come to terms on this one, and Blizzard have already announced that it's looking elsewhere for a new publishing partner in China. That isn't the only bad news Blizzard had this week. Jason Schreier of Bloomberg filed a report a few days ago revealing that a senior member of the WoW Classic dev team had quit the company, protesting something called Stack Ranking. For those unaware, Stack Ranking is a particularly vile corporate relic that forces managers to force rank their staff relative to each other, guaranteeing that certain proportions end up at both the top and bottom end of the spectrum. It sounds fine in theory until you get to the point where there are people unfairly pushed into that bottom category, even though they're performing their job perfectly well. And that bottom category comes with things like reduced bonuses, performance management, and the general expectation that you are not long for that company. Brian Birmingham worked at Blizzard as the co-lead of WoW Classic, but resigned when he refused to put an employee in that lowest category saying that they didn't deserve to be there. He didn't make his departure public, it was leaked by someone else, but when the news broke, he took to Twitter to provide an update in his own words, saying, quote, I can't participate in a policy that lets Activision Blizzard King steal money from deserving employees, and I can't be made to lie about it either, end quote. For now, it seems as though the matter is settled as Blizzard have accepted his resignation and publicly defended their shitty policy, saying that it helps facilitate honest conversations and guides lower performing employees to better outcomes. Wow, who'd have thought that Blizzard would deliver such a tone-deaf response? They've never done that before. Anyway, moving on. Let's pivot to some good news for a change. This week, Xbox hosted its first ever developer direct webinar, and I gotta say, this was a good one, both in terms of content and format. They only showed five titles, but they showed each of them well, allowing the developers to explain in their own words what each of these titles were about, showcasing plenty of actual gameplay, and generally keeping all of the fake trailers and marketing buzzwords far from the proceedings. It was basically perfect, no notes, and I hope that Xbox run this sort of format in the future and that other publishers follow suit. As for the content itself, it was good. We've got our first proper look at Minecraft Legends and man, is that taking shape? 
This demo showed off a PvP tower defense thing that looked all kinds of fun. I genuinely had zero interest in this game before the showcase, but I think it looks great and I'd be keen to check it out when it drops in its newly announced release date, April 18th. Next up was Forza Motorsport. And while I'm no racing aficionado, even I'll admit that I get where this guy was coming from. This is a seriously good looking racing game offering on-track ray tracing to produce some of the most sumptuous lighting and reflection effects ever seen in a video game. No release date for this one yet, but it's hitting sometime this year. Next cab off the rank was the new Elder Scrolls Online update titled Necrom. Now I'm gonna be real with you. I totally tuned out during this bit. I'm glad the Elder Scrolls Online continues to exist. I really like the dude who talks about it. Seems like a wholesome guy leading a wholesome community, but there's no room in my life for another live service MMO. Destiny is more than enough for me. Thank you very much. I do know that this expansion delivers a new class for the game, which is cool. And it arrives on June 5th for PC, June 20th for consoles. ESO people, I hope you love it. Okay, getting to the business end of things now. Time for a deep dive look at the next big thing from Arcane, makers of Dishonored, Prey, and the recent Deathloop. This is Redfall, and it's very different from anything Arcane have done before. We all thought that it was their take on Left 4 Dead, but it turns out this is more their take on Far Cry, and... I don't know, man. Something about this one just isn't clicking with me yet, especially after this trailer. The showcase detailed Redfall's expansive open world, which is carved into regions, and each region is protected by a big bad vampire boss. Take out a number of smaller mini bosses to gain access to the region boss, a la Far Cry. Within that overall loop, a, a range of side quests that involve, you know, killing vampires. And it looks cool, I guess. I mean, this is arcane here, so there's a variety of ways to accomplish your objectives. You get to play either solo or four player cop, which is great. But yeah, man, I don't know. Just something about this whole thing is not selling me right now. This is looking very video gamey, whereas arcane stuff has always felt kind of a cut above that. I'm definitely not prejudging it, I'm keeping an open mind, and I'm looking forward to reviewing it when the title drops on May 2nd. Of course, I missed one important announcement during the showcase, and that was the surprise reveal of Hi-Fi Rush. From developer Tango Works, famed for making creepy-ass horror games, comes a boppy cartoon rhythm action game. Because of course it does. What's next? Id Software putting out a PG 3D platformer. Nintendo release an X-rated visual novel starring Toad. Look at the shape of him, it just makes sense. I digress. Hi-Fi Rush absolutely stole the show when it was announced during the Direct and has stole the show every day since as it was shadow dropped, made playable just a few hours after the show thanks to the miracle of Game Pass. What a reveal, what a drop, truly one for the books. I'll talk more about this one in the review block later, but man, this is one hell of a video game. And that was the showcase. Yeah, we didn't get an update on Starfield, but you know what? I don't care. I think this was cool. I'm interested in most of these titles. I think the showcase showcased them beautifully. And as I said earlier, I think this was a big win for both content and format. And I hope Microsoft schedule another one of these sometime soon. It wasn't all good news for Microsoft though. Recently, it was revealed that a number of key developers from Playground Games, the team behind Forza Horizon games, have left the studio to set up their own thing. The new venture is called Maverick Games and is comprised of five former Playground devs, as well as veterans from other outfits such as Shark Mob, EA, Sega, and Sumo Digital. This is a big loss for Playground since they lost both their studio head and the Forza Horizon series director, and that is a series that has been absolutely crushing it over the last few years. Maverick Games is currently 10 people hoping to grow to 140 and are currently building a AAA open world action game. So, you know, that really narrows it down. From Team Green to Team Blue, what is the House of Jim up to? Well, right now they are riding high on the success of HBO's The Last of Us, which many went into skeptical about, but they've all fallen silent since then, especially after episode three, oh boy. HBO in partnership with Neil Druckmann have delivered a pitch perfect adaptation, honoring the source material while adding new details and storylines that broaden out this world. It should be a little surprise then that this week HBO announced that season two is locked in and Druckmann took things a step further by confirming that season two will be based on part two, the game. There would have been scope for things to go in a different direction after season one, perhaps a new never before seen chapter between the events of the two games. To be honest, I'd have been really into that, but alas, straight on to part two we go. And yeah, I don't know how that's gonna work. Part one was very plug and play into the TV format. Part two kind of really only works as a video game. And it's gonna be very interesting to see how HBO adapt that story. Plus, yeah, the discourse. Oh man, I'm so scared. We went through it before. I can't believe we have to do it all over again. You may wonder what impact all this success might have on Naughty Dog and their game making pipeline. The Last of Us part three question mark? 
Druckmann isn't ruling it out, but he certainly isn't committing to it either. Speaking to BuzzFeed, Druckmann said, quote, Our process is the same thing we did for part two, which is if we can find a story that comes up with this universal message and statement about love, just like the first and second game did, then we will tell that story. If we can't come up with something, we have a very strong ending with part two, and that'll be the end, end quote. By the by, in that same interview, he did shut down the possibility of any return to the Uncharted franchise, saying that Naughty Dog had moved on from that. Understandable, but still hurts to hear out loud. At least we'll always have Marky Mark as Sully. <laughs> Man, what were they thinking with that casting? One not so great piece of news for Sony is that gameplay of their upcoming Horizon multiplayer title has leaked. 10 minutes of footage spilled out onto the internet and it showcases a very different graphical style from the main games. Think Horizon meets Fortnite. I've only seen a few screens, but I think it looks good to be honest. And it very much appears as though this will be the co-op Monster Hunter style game we had guessed it might be. No word on when this one drops yet, but you get the feeling it won't be anytime soon. And finally, bad news for the Callisto Protocol. With Dead Space dropping this week to thunderous applause, it will no doubt sting for Striking Distance Studios to hear from their publisher, Crafton, that things aren't going so well on the sales front. Crafton slashed their sales projections for the title, which they had earlier put at 5 million units in the first year, but they've now revised that down to 2 million, saying even that, quote, will not be easy, end quote. Crafton had invested more than $160 into the game to get it made and marketed, but it's looking increasingly unlikely that they'll fully recoup those costs as negative reviews and word of mouth stop this one dead right out the gates. That is sad. I hate to see new studios stumble like that, and I genuinely hope that Striker Distance Studios is able to regroup and have another swing at things. A quick lightning round to finish off. A new single-player MechWarrior game is currently in development. The long-running series has struggled to find its footing in the modern era, but that hasn't deterred Piranha Games from saddling up for another entry. The title was confirmed by the studio's president, but he says they won't be formally announcing for a little while as yet, most likely the back end of 2023. How about another XCOM game? Any love for that idea, Fire Axis? Well, maybe, but XCOM lead Jake Solomon has confirmed that the studio definitely isn't working on a new XCOM game at the moment. He says that the studio remains fully focused on delivering all the promised DLC content for Marvel's Midnight Suns, the first of which just dropped in the form of the Deadpool update, which I'm actually really interested to check out. How about a Stranger in Paradise sequel? Well, Jack, gaming's most edgy boy, really felt like a one-shot affair, but there's at least a small chance he might make a return. That's according to producer Tetsuya Nomura, who says if they sell enough copies of the first game, then anything's possible. Personally, I think we could all do with a lot more Jack dialogue in our timeline, so I hope they make this happen. And finally, Destiny 2 was offline for a record 17 hours last week after a bug forced Bungie to bring the game down for maintenance. Distraught Destiny addicts resorted to extreme coping mechanisms like playing other games and going outside. Many of them have still not returned from these dangerous expeditions. Don't worry, they'll be back for Lightfall. We all try and escape at one point or another, but we all come back. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, the team behind Shadow Tactics and Desperados 3 are serving up something completely different. Shadow Gambit, the Cursed Crew. Let's take a look. This is Shadow Gambit, the Cursed Crew, a stealth strategy game where you join the Red Mali, a living ghost ship sailing the Caribbean during an alternate history of the Golden Age of Piracy. The team described this one as a stealth strategy game, which is very much in their wheelhouse. The audacity of the presentation, though, certainly isn't. They're shooting for a lot more color and vibrancy this time around, and frankly, I'm into it. No specific release date for this one yet, but it's hitting sometime this year. Remember that old Pharaoh game from back in the day? I worked retail back when this was on shelves, and this box is seared into my brain. Well, it turns out that this bad boy is getting a remaster. Pharaoh, a new era will be playable in 4K, will include a host of UI improvements, making for a more playable experience. A big highlight is the completely redone soundtrack, now fully orchestrated, which is, yeah, that's a nice glow up. Best of all, you won't have to wait long for this one as it drops exclusive to the PC on February 15th. Only one delay announcement this week and it's for the ill-fated Gollum. Man, whether it's his quest to get his mitts on his precious or the quest for a decent game adaptation, Gollum just can't seem to catch a break. The gameplay reveal from some time ago was so poorly received that it prompted the studio to delay the game, and that was after the game had already been delayed. The game has now been delayed for a third time and will now launch sometime between April and September this year, unless it gets delayed again, which, yeah, there's every chance of that happening. I don't hold out much hope for this one, but hey, hopefully we're all in for a nice surprise when this eventually drops. So what came out last week? Well, we briefly touched on Forspoken last week as reviews had just dropped, but that was only for PS5, since Square Enix did not release any PC review code for the title. For good reason, it seems, because by most accounts, this is just as bad a PC port as those laughable system specs led us to expect. To be fair, it isn't a total catastrophe. The game is definitely broadly playable on PC. Many people are
are reporting perfectly fine performance on a range of hardware. This is not one of Square Enix's worst ever PC ports because believe me, there have been some bad ones. Having said that, many people are experiencing huge issues relating to PC optimization and the title sits at just over 55% mixed on Steam with most of the negative reviews pointing to some sort of issue with the PC port. To Square's credit, they did release a PC demo for the game, allowing you to try before you buy to see how it runs on your rig. That is legitimately great of them, and I wish more publishers did that. But Forspoken is also, ironically enough, a good example of why demos aren't more prevalent, as social media is filled with people saying that they tried the demo for themselves and found that it either didn't run well on their rig or they just didn't like the game. I cruised the top sellers list on Steam this weekend and Forspoken was absolutely nowhere near the top of that list, which is a very rough start for a $70 game in its opening weekend. This is clearly another swing and miss from both Square and Luminous, and yeah, I expect we'll see Square trotting out the old did not meet expectations line at their next earnings call. In what can only be described as a whiplash inducing segue, let's now turn to Dead Space, a game that sent out review code nice and early to all and sundry across every possible platform, and wouldn't you know it, the game is amazing. Dead Space currently sits at an impressive 88% very positive on Steam and a rare mighty 90 on Open Critic, making it one of the highest reviewed survival horror titles across the whole genre. IGN scored this one a 9 out of 10, saying, quote, Dead Space is a superb remake and undoubtedly the definitive way to experience one of the best survival horror shooters that Capcom never made, end quote. And God as a Geek scored it a 9 as well, saying, quote, Dead Space is a fantastic remake, taking what was great about the original and adding plenty of smart, impressive features, end quote. 9 out of 10s and firm handshakes all around on this one. I actually reviewed it for myself, link below the like button, really blown away by how masterfully EA Motive were able to elevate a title that already held up so well. Every one of their interventions was so thoroughly considered and well executed, can't recommend it enough, even if you're not a survival horror fan. It's that good that I think everyone ought to give it a shot if and when it hits the price point that you're comfortable with. And don't forget, it will eventually end up on Game Pass, so you can also just sit tight until then. Speaking of Game Pass, how about that hi-fi rush? Holy shit, what a drop. Unbelievable that Tango Works have been working away on this thing in secret for four years, and then they just drop it in our laps, totally polished and totally popping. On Steam, this is sitting at 98% overwhelmingly positive, a number that precious few games from major publishers or developers ever managed to achieve. And at Open Critic, it's sitting at a mighty 91. Reviews are still rolling in, but Paul Tassi of Forbes scored at a 9.5, saying, quote, I would recommend Hi-Fi Rush to anyone, even many non-gamers. It's joyful, addicting, and something I may play twice just for the hell of it, an absolute win, end quote. I'm actually playing through this one right now. I chose to play this instead of Forspoken. Ah, uh, yeah, this absolutely rules. I can't get over how good it is, and I hope to have a review up by the end of the week. I can't imagine I have anything interesting to say about it. I will probably just spend eight minutes gushing and then call it a day. So what's coming out this week? Well, for a while now, I've been hyping February as a monster month, and it is, but that comes later. This first week is a little on the quiet side, giving us some time to play through Hi-Fi Rush or Dead Space or for Spoke. Sorry, couldn't get through that last bit without laughing. First cab off the rank this week is Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition, which launches for Xbox consoles today. RTS on a controller is something I just don't think I'm ever going to vibe with, but hey, it's cool that they figured out a way to make it work. The Definitive Edition includes heaps of new content, including three new campaigns and four new civilizations. A huge package, all of it either very cheap or on Game Pass. Inculinati, which I'm almost certainly mispronouncing, isn't a Pentiment DLC, though you'd be forgiven for thinking so because we've had basically zero games that look like this before, and now all of a sudden we've got two back to back. This one is not a narrative-led RPG, but is instead a turn-based strategy game. Think Slay the Spire dungeon crawling, but without the cards. It looks nice, and hopefully Pentiment has created more of a market for this sort of art style. It's hitting all platforms bar PlayStation on the 31st, where it too will be on Game Pass. Season A Letter to the Future is one I've had my eye on for a long time now. It's a really beautiful concept. The world is about to end, and you have to travel around chronicling what little of it you can in the hopes that the future will remember us. Reviews for this one have already dropped, and it's sitting at a strong 78 on Open Critic. GameSpot really enjoyed it, scoring it an 8 and saying, quote, Scavenger Studios' semi-open world adventure game is equal parts poetry, memoir, and mindfulness exercise, end quote. That hits PlayStation and PC today. That new SpongeBob game is finally here. After the remasters proved that there was still plenty of demand for SpongeBob adventures, developer Purple Lamp set out to make another one. This is an all new game, not a remaster, and it's essentially a spiritual successor to the battle for Bikini Bottom. It's looking perfectly old school and fun, and it's nice to know that games like this are still being made in 2023.
2023. That's out on all platforms today. Deliver Us the Moon was a narrative-led thriller that got a great reception when it released back in 2019. The sequel is shooting for more of the same thing, but on a different planet. Deliver Us Mars drops on all platforms bar the Switch on the 2nd. And finally, The Pathless makes its way to Xbox and Switch on the 2nd as well. This is one of those flow state games where you kind of glide through your environment, soaking up the visual spectacle and soundscapes. I absolutely love this and it really flew under the radar, I think. It deserves more attention, so I'm glad it's arriving on more platforms. If you're into these style of games, then trust me, take a chance on this one. You are going to love it. As you know, I'm a sucker for a good detective game, and one of the most interesting things about the genre is how often it inhabits different gaming styles and perspectives. First person, third person, 2D, 3D, interactive novel, walking sim, point and click adventure game, weird FMV stuff. Looking at you, Sam Barlow. That's why Shadows of Doubt caught my eye. It's a first person detective game using a really brilliant voxel based art style and it's bringing in immersive sim elements, allowing you to stealth, fight and explore in a variety of ways. It feels really ambitious for the detective genre, but despite that, it's being made by a very small team of people led by one Cole Jeffries. He's got a dev blog up detailing his making of the game. If you're interested, I'll leave a link to that below and I'll leave a link to the game over on my Steam Curator page, which also has links to all of the other put this on your radar stuff I've recently covered. I'll leave a link to all all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and we're at the end of the month, so be sure to grab all of your Games with Gold, PS Plus, and Prime Gaming stuff before it disappears for good, replaced by the February lineups. Some good stuff this month too, but before we dive into that, let's check in with Epic. Right now, you can still get the superb narrative game Adios, as well as offbeat survival horror top-down PvP shooter Hell is Others. On the third, they'll be replaced by two titles. The first is City of Gangsters, which is basically SimCity if all the property developers were criminals. So basically real life, but it's set in the era of Prohibition. The other title is Dishonored, Death of the Outsider, the standalone DLC follow-up to Dishonored 2, and probably the last piece of Dishonored content we're ever gonna get, sad times. Game Pass, holy shit, every few months Uncle Phil digs deep and delivers an absolute banging lineup, this month is one of them. Obviously, Hi-Fi Rush is the star, an absolute must-play for anyone. That Age of Empires 2 console version is on there, as is Inculinati, which I mentioned earlier. Same goes for that GoldenEye port, though that's not without its issues. If racing is your thing, then Grid Legends arrives on the service courtesy of EA Play, as does Hot Wheels Unleashed, one of the best surprises of 2021 and one of the best made arcade races released in a hot minute. Final shoutout goes to RoboQuest, which enters early access on console after earlier being available on PC. This is a really promising FPS roguelike with lots of nice buzz behind it. So do check it out and you can tell people that you liked it before it was cool. Look at you, Game Pass hipster out here. What about the PS Plus lineup? Well, at the time of writing, this has leaked, but it has not been confirmed. Hopefully it will be confirmed over the next day or two. According to the leaks though, we can expect the excellent Oli Oli World, one of the two top tier titles released last year by Roll17, the other being Rollerdrome. This is a cute, fun, gorgeous skateboarding game that found its way onto more than a few game of the year lists. Worth experiencing for the art style alone, I think. If you're looking for something a little more adult, then Mafia Definitive Edition for PS4 also hits PS Plus this month, though apparently that may not be available in all regions, so watch out for that. A truly superb remake of the original, and apparently we've got another Mafia game in development at the moment, so that's nice. But wait, there's more. The recently released Evil Dead game is apparently also making its way to PS Plus. This is one of those asymmetrical PvP games, it's meant to be pretty solid. And finally, Sony are giving away some of their newly purchased IP. Destiny 2 Beyond Light DLC is going to be up for grabs. This plus the free base game is more than enough to get you started in your Destiny addiction. And after that, you might want to top up with Witch Queen and the upcoming Lightfall, dropping at the end of the month. I'm so pumped for that. Please do not judge me. Finally, Prime Gaming from Twitch also unveiled their February lineup, and it's an uncharacteristically slower month than usual. The only one I'd really shout out is Morrowind Game of the Year Edition, which is nice and all, but you know, it's like 20 years old now. And if you haven't played Morrowind yet, then... What the hell you been doing? Our feel good story for the week takes us back to that familiar territory of weird video game peripherals that nobody asked for. And we've seen some doozies in our time, but I genuinely believe that this one takes the cake. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the Mew Talk. That's right, science has finally invented a device to catch all those heated gamer moments before they spill out into your living room. The MooTalk promises a 30 decibel reduction in noise travel with the added benefit of being sleek and stylish and not at all weird. It's like if Apple designed a sex toy for your face. The use case for the MooTalk is best showcased here where a young gamer can be seen having a little too much fun only for a person off screen to shush him. We're meant to believe that he's being told to be quiet, but the person off screen really is saying, put on the Gimp mask 
and your man is more than happy to oblige. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the show all buttoned up. And I want to say thank you as always for stopping by. Feels good to be able to talk again. So I had fun recording this one. I hope you had fun watching it. If you did, could I politely ask you to hit the like button? Last week's video was actually the most watched, most liked this week in video games ever with 450,000 views and nearly 30,000 likes. No idea why that video went as large as it did but I appreciate it nonetheless. If you'd like to stay a while and listen, then you can of course hit the subscribe button and ding the notification bell so you'll know the minute a video goes live. This week, aiming for that Hi-Fi Rush video. Uh, after that, not so sure to be honest. Might catch up on some backlog stuff, bit of Destiny seasonal content, recharge the batteries a little in preparation for February. Whatever you're planning on doing, I hope you have a fantastic week. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Guys, if you've been around the channel for a while now, you'll know that we're good friends with SteelSeries. They've been supporting what we do around here, and I've always been proud to have them as a partner because they consistently put out some of the best stuff in each of their chosen categories. Mice, keyboards, headsets, and more. All of it is industry leading and award winning. And if you don't believe me, go look up the reviews. You'll see for yourself. Well, a little while ago, SteelSeries dropped something all new, their range of arena desktop speakers. Coming in two 2.1 and 5.1 surround sound options, the arena range is a USB connected speaker set that can handle absolutely anything you throw at it from content creation to music to gaming and more we're talking crystal clear sound in the upper frequencies and plenty of bass when the situation calls for it plus you can fine tune that audio using the steel series sonar software the 2.1 and 5.1 options both support reactive prism sync rgb which flashes from the back of the speaker onto a wall and that color is synced up with whatever's happening on your screen providing a truly immersive lighting experience they also both include a midi subwoofer to deliver that bass and the 5.1 one option includes two wireless back speakers so you don't need to worry about running long cables out to them. Tech Radar reviewed these 4.5 out of 5 calling them epic and immersive. I use them myself at home and I concur if you are looking for a sleek well made set of PC speakers that look and sound absolutely fantastic then look no further than the Steel Series Arena range. Best of all because Steel Series is a fan of the channel they've graciously provided a special discount code to your boy that I can now pass on to you. If you enter offer code SKILLUP at checkout, you will score yourself a very juicy 12% off the purchase price. That code is valid for all products on the SteelSeries shop, mind you. So if you aren't in the market for some speakers but could do with a mouse or a keyboard upgrade, then be sure to keep that code in mind. It's offer code SKILLUP at checkout. Click the link below to visit the SteelSeries shop. Thanks SteelSeries for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.